and and then throw it to Andrew to do our introductions. All right, well, uh, welcome to Talk Math with Your Friends. It's my pleasure to introduce Dan McQuillan. Dan's the Charles A. Dana Professor of Mathematics at Norwich University, which is located in central Vermont. Um, his research is on topological graph theory, and he told us he's excited about this topic uh, that he's going to share with us today on vertex magic total labelings of graphs, because it doesn't require advanced knowledge uh, to get started, but you can have a lot of sophistication once you get into it. So take it away. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, BK, and all the organizers. This is such a great group. I love it. I love the friendliness and the openness and the um, excitement and the fun times you, you, you all have. So I'm really thrilled and honored to be here. And so thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about something, um, <laughs> silliness, I'm going to talk about something uh, much different from topological graph theory. I'm just going to talk about having graphs and putting numbers on them in a very particular way. Um, so here I have a graph with five vertices and 10 edges. Um, and I'm going to go through what some of these terms means. Um, I don't think we're going to need to do much adding, but on this slide, we're going to just so that we know what the definition is. It's one of those uh, topics where without the definition kind of, we, we got to make sure we have it. So I'm going to start off and um, let's look at the vertex labeled seven. If I take that number and add to it, the labels on the edges that touch it, uh, what do I get? 37. 37, okay, that's fast. So thank you for that. 37 is now the weight of the vertex labeled seven. Now I want somebody to take any other vertex and do the same thing and tell me what the total is. Thirty-seven. Okay, so which vertex were you looking at? The one uh, vertex eight. So this one also has weight thirty-seven. Okay, so if anyone finds a vertex whose weight is not thirty-seven, then let me know because I've made a mistake, which happens often, right? So um, the vertex magic property is the property that says that when you take the vertex label and add it to all of the incident edge labels you're gonna get the same total regardless of which vertex you started at. So that's what vertex magic means. Total labeling um, means that we're labeling both the vertices and edges, but then also in addition to labeling both the vertices and edges, we're doing it in such a way that every number uh, starting at one is used with no, with no gaps. So I'm going to try and verify that this is a vertex magic total labeling, and, th and that's not easy. So there's one, and there's two. So I can't skip three. So if I can't find three, I'm in trouble. OK, there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. OK, where's 12? 12 is there. And then 13, 14, and 15. So we've labeled, so the, the labeling has labeled all 15 objects. It's a bijection between the numbers one through 15 and the 15 objects in the graph. So that's what's required. And so now, now you know this is a hard subject because it just took me two minutes to verify that something was a vertex magic total labeling. And I didn't even fully verify it. So if it's that hard just, just to check, then it must be hard to come up with it, right? So there we go. So that's what it is. So now we're going to talk about some results and some problems. And I think that's the most adding of things we'll, we'll have to do. Now, one thing that's really important about this topic is that uh, you have some paper and some pencils or pens or something, and that um, I'm going to throw out some, some questions. And it, it's really important that you work on them instead of you know listening to me. Or you could do both at the same time or intermittently one or the other. So I'm going to already throw out a, a question for, for a challenge. This is a graph, five vertices, five edges. So this is the cycle C5. 
And so if I'm going to label this with a vertex magic total labeling, I need to use the labels one through 10. So I've got them there, right? So, and, and so I, I just want to kind of imagine moving them around in such a way that I get the same weight at every vertex. Okay, so every vertex, the vertex of the, the weight of every vertex will be found by adding three numbers. I've got to use each number one through 10 once each. So just play around with that for a while. See if you can do something with it. So maybe it's hard, maybe it's not. Um, it's okay. If you have fun with it, that's that's better. I, I would compare this to, um, you know, when you play Wordle and and you you have the situation where you've got all of the five letters, but they're all in the wrong order and you got to move the letters around. So that's where we are now. We've got the 10 numbers, we're putting them on things and then we're checking to see what happens. So do that. So maybe you'll get somewhere, maybe you won't. So I'm going to start um, showing examples. And based on these examples, uh, maybe it'll help or maybe it won't. So now I'm looking at a different graph while you're working on the other one. <laughs> so I've now got a different graph, a smaller one, C3, because maybe that'll help um, kind of build some muscles here. So I think I have a magic labeling here with a magic constant of 12. That's the weight of every vertex in this labeling. And now something interesting. There's a different way of labeling the same graph with the same numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the weight isn't the same. And so now I've got two questions I've thrown out. Um, one th thrown out to you, which is, one is to to try and just come up with a labeling with for, for C5. And another one is, um, well, how could you have two different magic labelings of the same graph with different magic constants? And then which magic co constants are possible even for a graph like C3? Mm -hmm. So this is interesting, right? Just a base, this basic idea of how can you have two different magic constants, we've got the same numbers used. So did I make a mistake or is there some indication? So the vertices weights only get used once, but the edges all get used twice. And so they're uh -huh. different sums, so they could have, so the, I, it seems fine to me that they'd be different numbers. Okay, that's awesome. So you just articulated, BK, thank you. The app absolute point. So if I look at the biggest label I have, which is six, this gets counted towards the weight of two vertices, but over here, it's just getting counted towards the weight of one vertex, right? So, that, so that's the point. So um, if, if we want the, um, the weight, the magic constant to be higher, then we're going to want uh, the largest uh, labels to be on the edges. And in fact, in this example up here, the largest uh, edges are on the the largest labels are on the uh, are on the edges, so that suggests that twelve is the largest possible magic constant, which it is. Okay, and so we can formalize that and make that precise. Oops. One thing I do want to say about this example, though, is that um, you know this is a theme that's going to come up again and again. So if, if you're not particularly good at adding numbers and I'm not, maybe you just like the idea of having big and small. So I'm going to take this example and I'm gonna replace everything big with everything small. <laughs> so more precisely, I'm gonna use the function X gets sent to seven minus X. So I'm gonna replace the one with a six and I'm gonna replace the six with a one like this. There's four, there's three. There's five. And if I do that, would you believe it? There's another magic labeling with yet another magic constant. That one would have magic constant nine. Okay, so that's called the dual labeling where you just replace the big with the small. And so I'll just put another question out there. Does this seem like it should always work? Is there something special about this graph that would make this work that would not be the case for other graphs? Um, so there is something special about this graph. It won't work all the time when you do that. Um, I, 
All right, so we'll get to that in a minute. But so now the next question is, can we do it for this one? And I think we can. So if I do it for this one, this would be five, four, two, three, six, and one. So now we have really all of the magic constants, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So we can do that pretty quickly and pretty easily. So this question maybe isn't so hard after all for the small cycles. We can, without too much work, uh, find all of the possible magic constants with some confidence of that. So now let's go to C5. Does, if anyone- Can I ask you two questions about the yeah. previous one? Yeah, please, maybe, please. Maybe I shouldn't ask these, but- No, go ahead, ask. The first one's more definitional. Is there, we're, we're treating the vertices and edges sort of asymmetrically. Is there a version of this definition where there's also a condition at the edges? So um, there is a definition called totally magic graphs where a graph is simultaneously vertex magic and edge magic. With and, different magic numbers, I yeah, assume? Yeah, okay. and, and there's basically no such, well, this is one of the open problems. Um, there's hardly any graphs like that. Basically, if you take, I think it's an odd number of copies of a triangle disjoint, then you can do those and then pretty much no, nothing else. Hmm. Uh, cool. or, but, it, but it's unknown. It's unknown. I mean, maybe if, if you get a big enough graph, there's a whole bunch out there that we just don't know. But I mean, um, so there are variations of this type of definition. So, so if you have a two regular graph, meaning every vertex has two edges incident with it, the concept of vertex magic and edge magic kind of coincide. So edge magic just means you, you calculate weights for edges instead of vertices. So I like two regular graphs because I feel like I'm solving twice as many problems, satisfying the vertex magic people and the edge magic people. Um, so, so anyway, that's a, that's a good are, question. Are, are there other, I mean, you know, so, so two regularity is kind of a symmetry condition, right? Like um, mm -hmm. if I have some other flavor of symmetry besides two regularity, um, what's a, sort of the, I mean, because because this this dual construction that you're doing like hinges on on so some it, kind of symmetry, right? It so means, it turns out it hinges entirely on regularity. Yeah. So so the dual the dual property, if you take a magic labeling and it, you have a regular graph, then taking the dual will always give you another magic labeling. And it's it's basically just because when you take the dual, you're re, you're replacing x with some number m subtract x. And you wanna make sure that you're doing the same number of counts uh, at each vertex. So, th so that basically translates into regularity. Okay, so I threw that out there and we've kind of already answered it. That's good, it just means we're kind of thinking roughly what's going on here. So there is a concept of duality, but it only works for regular graphs. Now, if anybody has a labeling for C5 that works, that's magic, you know, please just kind of un unmute yourself and read out the, the labels, maybe starting from here, and I'll just write them down. Well, I have a conjecture based on what you did above. Okay, good. So let's label the vertices one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. And then starting between one and two, let's put six. Okay and then go the other direction, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the other direction, do you want the seven between two and three? No, between the one and the five. So I don't think that's working. I haven't checked it, but it seemed like the it was a pattern I saw in one of your things above. Yeah, so this is gonna be 18 and this is not gonna be 18. Right. Okay, so um, it, it's not, um, something like this will work. So I think I'll just show you something like this that ends up working. And this is really the only example of something that works fairly simply. I'm going to do it uh, kind of the other way. I'm going to start with one, skip an edge, go to two, skip an edge, go to three, skip an edge, go to four, skip an edge, go to five. So I'm starting with that. And, and so, um, now, what I'm going to do is just imagine what the weights are so far. And I think the smallest weight is right here. 
right? The smallest weight is what we have right there. So that, so far I haven't labeled the vertices, but I've got a weight of four at that point. And then this gets a little bit bigger right here, right? So we have a weight of four and then we go to a weight of five and then we go to a weight of six and so on. So all we're doing now, um, so I'm not gonna add anything. All I'm gonna do is take advantage of the fact that the weights of the vertices seem to be going uh, consecutively and use the labels remaining to kind of compensate for that. So I have 10, nine, eight, seven, and six. And so that just compensates for the fact that we have increasing uh, weights uh, by labeling it partially. Okay, and so this um, has a magic constant of, I don't know, 14 or something like this. Here I've got the edges being small. I can dualize it and, and, get, um, and get a bigger magic constant of 19 if I dualized it. Okay, and so I'm guessing that no one right now has found another one. Uh, most people, if they work on C5 for long enough, get something like this and then realize the pattern extends. There are very few cases where a nice pattern extends. This is pretty much almost the only one uh, that I know of where a nice pattern extends. Okay, so I'm going to go on now. Uh, just, you know, um, in general, um, in terms of how we start off answering these questions. So let's say I have a cycle, um, you know, BK's observation before. So I'm going to let SV be the sum of all vertex labels and SE be the sum of all edge labels. Uh, so BK mentioned that um, the edge labels are counted twice. And so uh, if we know that and we go around to every vertex and add H up at all of the N vertices, we get an equation here and then we get an equation there. And then uh, we know how to, um, to add the consecutive numbers starting at one and two N. We all have favorite way of explaining it. My favorite way, by the way, is not to write it forwards and backwards and then add them and then divide by two, although that's, I, I do that every single time also. My favorite way is to start with the more general fact that you can find a sum if you know the average and the number of terms. And then just for a, an arithmetic series, you can find the average by taking the average of the first and the last. So that's kind of a more general perspective. So once we know that for two regular graphs, um, so we get this equation. And so rather than just deriving it, I just want to point out that, um, so I make a lot of mistakes. So I just want to test it. So we, <laughs> so we just observed by uh, experiment there that for C3, the smallest was nine and the biggest was 12. And so the sum of the edge labels has to be at least as big as one plus two plus three for C3, and for C3, the sum of the edge labels has to be at most four plus five plus six. And so this is six and six divided by three is two. And then we add seven and we get nine for the smallest. And if we do that here, we get 12 for the biggest. So that's what we found in our experiment. And if we test it for C4, uh, we find that one plus two plus three plus four are not possible choices or edge labels because this is not an integer. Uh, and so what that means is that if you try and label C4 with one, two, three, and four on the edges and five, six, seven, and eight on the vertices, it won't work. Okay, so that's already interesting. And it's, it's already part of the issue where um, sometimes parity makes a big difference. Okay, so we'll revisit that later. And um, just to indicate what some of the recent results are, because there's so many open problems, almost anywhere you look, there's an open problem. If you take this, um, if you take the relationship between H and the sum of edge labels and you get your normal bound, this is gonna be your, your bound of magic constants when N is odd, it'll be different when N is even slightly, but when N is odd, you get this bound. And so we know in general how to get the smallest and the biggest magic constants. But even if we ask for the question of find one more than the smallest, which in the dual of that would be one less than the biggest, that's already a hard question. Most people who work on this probably think that all values between um, the minimum and the maximum can be achieved or realized as magic constants, but it seems to be very difficult. So unless there's some kind of clever existence proof, we don't know how to. 
So one of the things we can do with uh, students really nicely, and these are very open problems, just take a specific value and see if you can do it. And these turn out to be very difficult problems. And the reason they're very difficult is that nothing scales well. Okay, so um, when you double something, you don't double the condition that you use every single number with no gaps, right? And so any attempt to use linear algebra, well, there's the possibility that you're gonna end up with several quantities being the same thing. So this doesn't really work well. So I'll just mention the names of a couple of students who have found the second biggest magic constant very recently, uh, Chandon last semester, for example. And it was, it was very difficult and I could show that later. Right now, what I wanna do is show a couple of tricks that I learned. This one uh, I um, saw from uh, Jim McDougall, who I'll mention a little bit more later. This is a standard magic square. So this has nothing to do with the graph at this point. So you've seen the tic-tac-toe board, right? The sum of the numbers on any row is 15 or any diagonal is 15. So um, in a talk in, in 2001, Jim came to Southern Illinois University where I was and gave a colloquium on this and showed this bizarre trick of how to use the, the magic square. So first of all, we're going to take, we're going to, we're going to ignore the property that the sum of the diagonals is constant because somehow we don't need that. So I'll just show you the trick. So we're going to take one of the columns and put it here and we're going to take the other column and put it there just to get this big number at the top left corner. And the reason we're doing that is because, well, we don't really want that big number. So we've now interchanged a couple of the columns the, and, and we've now deleted the number nine. And now we're gonna take this, not a magic square anymore, but we're gonna turn this into a vertex magic total labeling of a different graph. So this is a bizarre trick. And so just for a little map, this is gonna be a vertex. That's gonna be a vertex. And these are going to be ver vertices. And the edges are going to work like this. So the edge joining five and two is going to be labeled with seven. The edge joining five and four is going to be labeled with three, and so on. So it's all just lined up like that. So that means I think I want to put a, a five up here and a one here. So the edge between two and five is going to be labeled seven. Five and four is going to be labeled three. Two and one should be labeled six. And then uh, one and four should be labeled eight. And so hopefully if I did this correctly, this will be a magic labeling because the numbers at any vertex will correspond to one of the rows or columns where the sum is supposed to be the same inherited from the magic square. So this is a cool trick. Did I do it correctly? It looks like I did, right? 15 is the, is the sum we expect. And so this... Mm -hmm. This, um, this trick should allow us to take any size magic square and get a, um, get a magic labeling for a, bi a complete bipartite graph that's a little bit smaller. So I'll go over what that is quickly, but that's a nice trick. And so now I'm gonna show you another trick, right? Just so that we can, you know, a lot of this is just having an awareness of things, right? So that was a graph theoretic awareness, I guess you'd realize that you could inherit something from things that we already know. So now I'm going to inherit something from just number theory awareness, right? Just, just awareness, nothing else. We have this example where, so I've, I've already cheated because I started at zero, right? <laughs> and so the vertex magic total labelings are supposed to start at one, but I took one of our vertex magic total labelings and I subtracted one from everything in sight. So we have the, the property that if we have one of these, we could add one to everything inside and get a vertex magic total. Like, like so there's, the regularity plays a role as well, right? So if you have a regular graph, you can subtract a number from every label and still have the magic property. Okay, so I, I just cheated a bit and started, started at zero. So now in this example, I've got the small numbers on the vertices and the big numbers on the edges. Filter that from the perspective of grade school division. If you divide by five and you have a remainder, the quotient for the big numbers would be one and the remainder for the big numbers, well, the remainders is, is what you get when you divide by, when you divide by uh, five. So take all of the numbers that we see and filter them through the lens of division by five, looking at quotients and remainders. In this particular example, 
the quotient labeling we have is itself magic, which is strange. There's no guarantee that that would happen. The remainder labeling by itself, right? So if I look at nine and divide by five, I get a remainder of four, right? But the remainders themselves have the magic property. So there's no guarantee that that would happen if you start with a magic labeling. So if you happen to have a labeling where it kind of factors through something like this, then there are other tricks you can do with this, right? So for example, um, if I think of these zeros, notice that, that everything with a zero here, the quotient of zero, those all have different remainders as you would need. But once we understand that, we can swap the zeros and the ones on the quotient labeling, right? So that would have the effect of switching the small with the big, right? So you can do that, but then you can glue them back together in a different way. But there are other ways to kind of just number theoretically stick these numbers back together instead of having um, the numbers filtered through division by five, I could instead do something like this. So once I have my broken up labels, once I have my uh, factored version, I can put them together in a different way. So instead of uh, thinking of it as multiplication by five, uh, I can think of it as multiplication by two. So that means if I do this, I'm gonna take two of these and then add that last part. So when that happens, we'll get a two here, nine there, Okay, so what's two lambda, two lambda plus mu. So it's gonna be two times zero plus zero is zero. Two times two plus one is five. We'll get another magic labeling with constant 14 using the same uh, quotients mu and the same remainders lambda, but repurposing them. So you can just recombine them and get a different labeling that way. That'd be eight, two times four is eight, and this would be one, two times three is six, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, a labeling which can be kind of factored through, then you can recombine them in a variety of different ways. So now um, just kind of roughly- And the two and the five come from the fact that it was originally a labeling of 10 and those are yeah, factors, that's right. okay. That's right, yeah, yeah. But, it, but what's bizarre about it is that when I look at the quotients here, I have the magic property on, on this. The weight here, just even though I'm not using numbers one through 10, but the weight is two everywhere. And over here, the weight is the same everywhere. It's six everywhere. So the fact that I have magic property factored through allows me to recombine it in a different way. So, so, so that's a part of the magic. I mean, like, so, so the magic property is linear. No, right? this, this like is the, a special example. I mean, it's, there's in general, if you have a magic labeling, there's no reason that it should factor through so that the quotients and the remainders would also be magic. Fact, no, 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 but, but I just mean, if you have two, if you, if you have the magic property on two labelings and you add them together, oh yeah, you're yeah. going to get the right. So this is just a number yeah. theory thing, like yeah. just a, an understanding of number theory and so on. Okay, so one of the first projects we did um, was, so with Katie Smith, who, you know, this was work done in 2002, now she's Dr. Smith, right? Um, so she actually, together, we found labelings for um, odd complete graphs for any N, um, for any magic constant in a wide range. So this was a surprising and unexpected result. And so we just used this lens of factoring things. So for KN, there's a N choose two edges and then N vertices. And so it, you can always uh, end up factoring it as N multiplied by N plus one over two. And then, um, and then that allowed us to get multiples of N. So for K5, we could somehow recombine and re purpose the labelings to get magic constants of 35, 40, and 45. And then we did something uh, kind of silly that seemed to work. So we just foolishly took every label and subtracted one. 
So just off the vertices though. So like this, like that, and like that. But the problem is that zero isn't one of the numbers we're supposed to use. So then we turn that into a five. And then if you swap these two labels, it fixes everything. Because <laughs> if you swap these two labels, this vertex has the same weight, but this one goes down by, um, goes down by five. And this is a silly idea, but we found a way to make it work all of the time. And we were able to make it work by using just normal quotients and remainders as a lens through which to view all of the numbers. So we weren't really adding any numbers. So I'm skipping over this quite quickly, but I just wanted to give the idea that um, there's some structure there and uh, you can avoid actually doing any addition. So now I wanna just quickly go to some of the basic questions. Regular graphs seem to be important in this discussion so far. So I just wanna remind us of the definition that, um, well, K2 is not magic because we have to use three different labels, X, Y, and Z and X plus Y. If that's gonna equal Z plus Y, then um, X would have to, X would have to equal Z, which it's not allowed to. So that wouldn't be magic. Two disjoint copies of a triangle isn't magic, isn't vertex magic. And that's because a computer search shows that you can't do it. So if you don't like someone, ask them to, to, to look for one. <laughs> McDougall in his talk um, in that, that I was very happy to, to, to see, um, said stated the conjecture that every regular graph of degree at least two except for two disjoint triangles uh, would have uh, a magic labeling and so i spent some time trying to find counterexamples and and did not so, but i was very excited about it so now i i just want to get an idea of whether the magic property should have anything to do with this i mean the regular property should have anything to do with it here is a graph that is not regular, clearly. And I'll tell you that either it doesn't have a magic labeling or else it will be easy to find it because there'll only be one and you can find it quickly. So I wanna know if this graph is magic. This is your uh, test to see if you know the basic definition. This is the cue to stick up the pole. So I want some kind of, um, there we go. So I have a pole. Um, so we have one vertex V in the middle and and three uh, vertices connected to it sticking out. So I have a vertex of degree three. Let's see, can I, so you can see the, the graph underneath, right? So I've got a vertex of degree three and, and uh, three vertices of degree one. And so I wanna know, I want everyone to kind of vote. Yes, it has a labeling. Yes, I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure. And no, I can prove it doesn't. <laughs> Wait just a little bit longer. Okay, so so I think that's pretty good. Most people are so I, I think that's okay, right? So um Let's take the poll down and I'll, I'll give some explanation. Oh, it's, are we get closing in on it? Yes, yes and no are closing in on being equal? Yeah. <laughs> yes, but I'm not sure. And no, but I'm not sure <laughs> about well, neck and neck. Yeah, so no I, one's- I, I'm gonna, I, I didn't vote, but I, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. So I, I don't know if not sure counts, but I, I'm, I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Okay, so, so so my thought would be you have to have three different pairs that add up to the same number. So it's like one, six, two, five, uh, three, four, or one, seven, two, six, three, five. And then just figuring out if I could put the remaining number on the central vertex and make either of those work. Okay, so. So I'm going to now give an explanation. I'm happy that the total is so close. So can we remove the, 
the uh, at least on my screen the poll is in the way of the screen is that always the case i think you just i think the you have to close it personally on your end oh, okay so i can get rid of it on my screen and so can anyone else or i have to do that here or how do i get rid of oh i see everyone can individually move it is that right i think so okay okay good so i'm just going to use this as an excuse to to illustrate what regularity does so if you look at vertex v the weight of vertex V is going to have four sum ends, and everybody else is going to have two sum ends. So the question is, does having more sum ends than everybody else already doom the situation? So I'm going to try and make V have the smallest weight possible by giving it the four smallest numbers, one, two, three, and four. So that means the, the smallest the weight of V could possibly be is already 10. Right, because that, that's giving it the smallest things. But now I've got two, three, and four on the on the edges. So if I do something like five, six, and seven, I've got to use five, six, and seven because I can't skip anything. I already can't make up for the fact that the weight of V is too big. So here in this example, we see that irregularity is already causing a problem just because there's too many sum ends to calculate the weight of vertex V. Okay, so, so irregularity is a problem. And basically, McDougall's conjecture says that if you remove that, you should be able to, to label anything. All right, so um, of course, we always want to generalize. Um, this particular graph, K13, is a special case of the complete bipartite graph, Kn, n plus 2. And so um, just for fun, we won't take as much time on this one, but just for fun, let's put the poll up here. So for the professional mathematicians who want to just guess for the fun of it, should Kn n plus 2 be magic now that you've understood the idea that the irregularity causes a problem? <laughs> I've got a few options here. So either it's probably magic for sufficiently large n, uh, maybe parity has something to do with it because we've discussed that. Uh, no, not for any n, and and maybe uh, there's an uh, another another option that's not covered by these three possibilities. Okay, so let's quickly come up with a, a guess. Guesses are anonymous. Just curious as to what one sense of it. It's also a test in my case of how well I've communicated some of the basic ideas. So I love this. Let's get at least five. Let's get at least five guesses in here. <laughs> I mean, that conjecture. Oh, no, that was about regular graphs. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, all right. I'm going to. Um, so, yes, for sufficiently large n is the more popular one. That's what I would have expect, expected from this group. Um, it's a good it's a good answer. But in fact, it's never the case. There's no n for which this is magic. And that's a little surprising. And that's back in the original uh, paper. So um, let's see, I'll skip over this. The original paper, so let me just mention, I think that the group of authors is a really cool group of authors. So uh, I was at SIU and I met Wal Wallace there and Jim McDougall came to give a talk. And Merkin Miller is extremely prolific on these sorts of questions and Professor Slamman, uh, Indonesian mathematician, they work really well and I imagine that they're uh, very fun as well. So Jim came and gave this talk and. And during his, his talk, he gave the conjecture. And you know, I spent a long time trying to, um, trying to find a counterexample and then became convinced there wasn't. And so um, after uh, six months, and then uh, of course, a couple of years to publish. Um, so I showed that many cubic graphs are vertex magic, including all generalized Peterson graphs and many other things. And so the idea was really, really simple. It's just about balancing uh, big numbers with small numbers and so on. Um, I think rather than showing this one, I'm gonna show something very similar that was done by Ian Gray under the supervision of Jim McDougall. His result has the same flavor, but it's a much more striking result. So, and I'll just give an idea of how this result works. Um, so with Ian Gray, they showed that every Hamiltonian regular graph of odd order is vertex magic. And so we've already done enough that we can uh, understand what's going on here. So I'm just going to take right here on the right, a Hamiltonian graph of order seven. 
Okay, and so the goal is to find a vertex magic total labeling of this graph. And so I made this graph just by taking the Hamilton C7 first and just randomly adding a two factor, meaning two edges incident with every other vertex, right? So I just did that quite randomly. But of course we know that um, we know this pattern of starting with one, skip an edge, two, skip an edge, three, skip an edge, four, skip an edge, five, and so on. So we know how to, to follow this pattern. And then, um, then we can compensate by using the remaining labels to, to balance out the partial weight so far. So this is just like how we did it for C5. So now we have a labeling, which you believe we can get, where the biggest labels are on the vertices. So that's what Ian, Ian Gray's construction needs. And so now what I wanna do is explain how the construction works, focusing on this one vertex here labeled 13. So the construction is gonna work like this. We're gonna take all of the vertex labels and we're gonna stick them on some of these new purple edges. I've oriented the purple edges to give them a direction. And the, so the, the vertex label is going to move to the outgoing, so here's the outgoing edge from where it was before. So the vertex label 13 is now gonna label the outgoing edge. Now I'm gonna do that for every single vertex. And so um, if I look at one plus five plus 13, that's gonna give me whatever the magic constant was over here. So I guess that was 19. But the thing is, if I do that at every vertex, then the, the weight isn't gonna be 19 because every vertex has both an outgoing and an incoming edge. But the incoming edges are surprises. But it doesn't matter that they're surprises because they're consecutive in order. So that means I can use new labels for the vertices to compensate for those, right? So I need new labels for the vertices. I'm going to stick new labels on the vertices. After I do this trick of putting all of the old vertex labels on outgoing edges, the partial weights will be in consecutive order. I'll have consecutive numbers for the vert vertex labels to balance that out. Okay, so that's pretty quick, but that's basically the idea behind Ian Gray's um, uh, idea. So that works really well. And um, so this is how you finish that off. And the original idea for the cubic graphs we had works in the same way. So I'll skip over this, but anyone who's watching it on video, the, these red edges are gonna be used here. So this is small, so it's gonna go with big and it'll go on outgoing. And then you're gonna use these labels for the vertices, and then you'll do something analogous over there. So it's almost the same kind of idea with this hint, you might be able to essentially uh, rediscover the, the paper that I had on cubic graphs that took me six months. But I'm just going to skip over that really quickly. I just want to mention some of the results that we got with some of our um, students over the years quickly. Gray's construction, which was really brilliant, it, um, it works whenever you have a two regular graph with a strong labeling, which means you have the biggest numbers for the vertices. So then his goal and a big part of his PhD thesis was to try and find vertex magic total labelings for all two regular graphs with odd order, because then he knew he could fill them in, right? So he was moving beyond the Hamiltonian ones at this point. And so he noticed, so let me just say, he noticed that these are the three two regular graphs that didn't have a strong labeling, meaning the biggest labels on the vertices. And so he conjectured that, that graphs of this form didn't have strong vertex magic total labelings. So one of the things that we did here with Jeremy Holden and my brother was we proved that all of the two regular graphs of that form, in fact, do have strong vertex magic total labelings, except for the ones that Ian Gray found by computer search. So, <laughs> so sometimes small things get in the way and this made us very, very happy. And that was very, very complicated. Um, this is just random gratuitous, um, strong vertex magic total labelings from Gray's thesis. Um, of disconnected two regular graphs for no reason. So let's skip over that. 
But now I just want to kind of phrase McDougall's conjecture a different way. One way to think of it is, if you know the degree sequence, you don't need to know the structure. You know it's you know it's magic if all the degrees are the same, right? So I'm just trying to say it vaguely so that I can generalize it. So one way I tried to generalize it was to ask the question, does the degree sequence determine whether or not the graph is magic? And so again, more student work with Ardmi's Golkar Amne, we wanted to find um, an infinite, infinitely many degree sequences such that uh, for each degree sequence, there was a magic graph and a non-magic graph with that degree sequence. And so we used Kn n plus two as our magic graph, as our non-magic graph. And so we tried to construct uh, in some graphs that we could label with the same degree sequence. Of course, the degrees are the problem, right? But the, the proof that Kn n plus two isn't magic is a little bit more subtle than just looking at degrees. It actually did require the structure of the graph itself. And so we were able to do something uh, clever. Well, better, otherwise this is not going to be possible, right? Yeah, that's right, right. So the, the proof for Kn n plus two is a little subtle. It's, it's in the original paper on the subject. So I'll just tell you what we did. Um, of course, there's many ways to build a graph, but what we did was we took a K7 uh, and deleted from the K7 a two factor. I'm using K7 as an example. This will work in general. So we took a Kn, but so in this picture, uh, we have a K7. If you delete a, a two factor from it, then every vertex so far in the K7 will have degree four. And then we're going to just add connecting uh, edges from each vertex here to every vertex over on the other, over on another K7 over here. On this one over here, we don't delete a two factor. So the vertices over here have degree higher, but then it doesn't quite match. So we had to artificially lower the degree of one vertex by two, and then we did it kind of with this picture. So anyway, just kind of quickly skipping over the details. But the idea here is that in this paper with Art Mies, we used the control we had from the quotients and remainder from Katie Smith's paper. And we also used some of the really difficult technical stuff from Jeremy Holden's paper to actually construct the graph. Um, so we were able to succeed, and this was very difficult. And also, in the same paper, work with Keith Gibson, um, the sun graph is magic, so you know how to draw, your children can draw a picture of a sun. So the sun graph is basically that. So we labeled this, and then there was some difficult work to find a different graph with the same degree sequence as the sun graph uh, that isn't magic. So all of that got wrapped up into a, a paper there. Um, and so um, here's just the picture of the, the labeling of the sun graph uh, for you to perhaps enjoy later. Okay, so that, that's kind of the end of the technical part of the talk. And now I'm just going to quickly run through a few references uh, to, to say thanks to some people. Oh, first of all, thanks to the to students, Keith Gibson, and especially Ardmiz Gokar Emne. I mean, that was the really hard part of the work that we spent a lot long time on. The sun graph part was a kind of a semester project. The getting the other labeling was much, much more massive undertaking. We did it for both a summer and in a semester and it was very difficult, but like a lot of this work, um, you know, once you kind of get it, then it's, it's okay because we're not really adding numbers. We're just rearranging things and matching big with small. Uh, so happy to work with uh, Katie Smith, who's now Dr. Smith. And that was really elegant and I would say unexpected at the time that it was done. Um, just for other references, there's a really nice book on all kinds of different magic graphs by Alison Marr and Wal Wallace. The original paper I had to mention, and I especially wanna thank Jim for giving a very inspiring talk that got me into this. At the time I was at Southern Illinois University, I was hoping to um, work permanently at a kind of liberal arts college teaching focused idea, but wanted 
but didn't want to um, give up research at all, right? And so how do you find a topic that's suitable for undergraduate research? And so I went to this top, uh, this talk by Jim and it changed my life. So I'm so grateful for him. Uh, the work by Ian Gray was ingenious. And so I'm very thrilled about that. And then just kind of mentioning some personal highlights, the work with Jeremy and with my brother, Jim on uh, clarifying a conjecture that Ian Gray had on two regular graphs. By the way, most of the conjectures are still out there. Most of the important parts of the conjectures are still there. We still don't know how to find strong labelings for these graphs. We still don't know which magic constants are possible from almost any graph you could think of. There's very few problems that you would uh, solve. And I'll mention also Addie Armstrong, who was also Dr. Armstrong and a professor of mathematics as well. So I'm so happy that we were able to do that work as well. And this, this work, Vertex Magic Cubic Graphs, um, this came out of my attempt to, to find a counterexample to McDougall's conjecture, which I now realize was foolish because I believe it was probably true. Um, and so, um, so I'm very happy that, that one can ask these questions and, and, and not be able to answer them too easily and still discover some interesting and nice math. So I think my time is up. I got really close to the border, but um, I'm extremely uh, grateful to the organizers. Thank you so much, BK, for moving this along, uh, really helping me out there. I also just say to anyone out there that I'm, you know, please reach out and email me if you want any, any more information about any of this. And I'm really happy to, to oblige. Um, really what I, would like is just um, for people to work on some of these problems um, and to see, even though that they're technical in nature, they're, they don't have to be viewed that way when we solve them. So it's all about matching things up and, and using some simple mathematics to get hints and clues and being aware of structure. All right, so thank you so much. Thank you, well Dave. Well, the, I mean, the, the obvious question early on was going to be like, is this accessible for student research? But you've made a very compelling case that this is uh, very much so. So um, like the other question is, is there a application where this sort of balancing condition is the condition that you would want to be true? Uh, or did this come from more from a puzzle kind of perspective? So I think the, the history of this particular ver so graph labeling problems have applications everywhere, but this particular version of it came from a puzzle. Um, I think the version of it was invented by an Australian group making challenge problems for uh, high school students. And it was when there was corruption in the Olymp on some kind of Olympic committee. And the question involved putting different amounts of money in Olympic rings or something. And then when you look at that and generalize it, then you see that it's it's actually this concept. Um, so, uh, and that's explained in Alison Marr and Wal Wallace's book quite clearly, as well as the original paper uh, on the subject. I would say though, um, for the two regular graphs, it's equivalent to edge magic. And edge magic is more serious. It's connected to graph decompositions in ways that I don't really understand. And so the first paper on uh, edge magic two regular graphs, a kind of equivalent to this, goes back to uh, Kotzik and Rosen, 1970. And that's a, I, I don't have that here, but you can just Google it. They call it magic valuations of graphs. And so they have, um, th they actually label. Um, provide a vertex magic total labeling of, of any cycle in there as well, although they didn't call it that. So they do have that. So this goes back to 1970. And I think there are some applications for graph labeling um, from that perspective, graph decompositions from that perspective. But I ignore, I ignore the applications. I just like the puzzles. <laughs> um, and then I agree, beautiful slides. If you're comfortable sharing them, just send them to me as a file and we'll we'll link them on our website. Um, but if not, um, photos, and then of course, we'll upload this to YouTube so people can always pause the video on our YouTube channel if, they, if you missed an image. I, I put a lot of stuff in there quickly, assuming people would watch the video later or, you know, or really what I want is, so math papers are hard to read, including all of the papers that I cited. But the examples on this video are kind of introductions to the papers. 
So my feeling is you could take any of the papers I cited there and look at the kind of examples, maybe understood the understand the examples, and then realize, especially for young people, you would then realize, oh, I understand this, so I should be able to read the paper. So I really do hope that it is kind of a gateway towards, you know, learning how to read math papers or or realizing that there's sophistication and not just you know technical elements to it and structure everywhere. So I'm I'm really hoping that this is you know, a way into mathematics. Um, so thank you. <laughs> and then uh, Charles asked, can you generalize this to simplicial complexes, like <laughs> labeling <laughs> higher dimensional faces and things? I don't know if I can, maybe someone here can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, it's good. There's so many questions. There's so many questions. Whatever you would ask is probably unknown. <laughs> Rashmi, did you have a, a thought or question? Um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, sort of. I might try seeing if I can turn it into math art. Oh, that would be that would that would be so wonderful. <laughs> mm, that's cool. Like uh, maybe like using the labels as a color gradation and seeing if mm, if you perceive yes, patterns or you think of something else. Um, I'm not sure at this point. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> Any uh, other last question before? Oh yeah, go for it, Jared. Yeah, I just had a quick one, Dan. So you mentioned a couple of those examples that like don't have the magic labeling, the total magic yeah. labeling. Um, and you said a couple, like we did one where you sort of had a reason and we did another where you said it was brute force computer search. Yeah. Like to what extent is there sort of like a theory of like, oh, for these graphs, they can't have a color because of this, a coloring it because of this, sorry, a magic labeling because of this invariant versus we just have no idea, but we tried them all. So I'm not, yeah, I, most of the, um, most of the arguments I know of, I wouldn't say I know all of the papers or, or everything here, you know, I do what I do, but um, I, I think that uh, the degree is the only obstacle that I know of. In the case of the complete bipartite graph, there's it's a little bit more subtle than that, but it's still in the original paper and there's not that much there. So I think your question is a good one and no one knows the answers. I, I think to some extent, that's what I'm trying to answer by, by asking the question, to what extent does the degree sequence determine whether, whether the graph is magic or not? You know, is it about the structure of the graph or not? And, and then we discovered the structures that matter. The bipart property of the graph was, was a big part of the obstacle. But that's only, that's vague. That's not an answer, right? So no one knows, I think. Well, lovely, and that's our time. I hope everyone will come back and join us in two weeks when our guests will be Dr. Adriana Salerno of um, Bates and currently the NSF. Um, and please join me one more time. And thank you, Dan, for a lovely talk. And again, thank you so much, PK and, and everyone at this group. It's just wonderful. I'm honored to be able to contribute. Our pleasure. Thank you.